Okay, this is the Urban Survivalism Seminar slash Workshop. My name is John. I write under J.M. Perkins. And first thing I'd like to point out is I would think about this more as something that'll come in handy for your writing or for your game playing. I hope that you never have to use any of this advice. Of course, it can be used that way, but if I'm the best, I hope I'm not the best expert you ever hear talk about this stuff. But yeah, I originally presented this uh, PowerPoint presentation at Conjecture in 2012, and I thought I'd record an audio version of it because the recording video didn't work. So now you're going to see the slides and hear my voice, and yeah, feel free to share this with whoever, and I hope it's useful for you. First off, just a quick outline of what we'll be talking about, you know, an overview of who I am and why I'm giving this talk. Uh, you won't be able to see it, but I'll talk about my Go Bag, which I used as a framing device for this talk. Then the big three for me are water, food, and then violence protection. There's also shelter and hygiene, but I don't spend too much time on those because I think those are a little bit more self-explanatory. There's also some miscellaneous stuff and then recommendations and Q&A, although you won't be able to do a Q&A because you're listening to, or you're rather watching a video. So I would like to point out first off is that the apocalypse is always tardy. This picture is from San Diego. This was a billboard ad, and what happened is there was a Christian sect here back last year, in 2011, who was just convinced that they knew the last day, which was May 21st, 2011. They had their members sell all their possessions, cash in all their financial instruments, and yeah, they took that money and they used it to buy billboard and bench ads. And of course, the world didn't end then. I'd like to point out first off before we proceed that a better term for what I'm going to be talking about today is societal collapse instead of apocalypse. Apocalypse means the end of the world. And whether that's going to happen or not, it's kind of a moot point because you can't survive if the earth blows up. But you can survive and, and potentially thrive if society collapses because that's happened in the past and it will probably happen at some point in the future to a varying degree. So mostly what I'll be talking about is kind of the, the looser term of apocalypse, which is basically societal collapse. So here are some quote unquote realistic scenarios on what could make a society, uh, ours or another society, collapse. I'll give you a moment just to read all that through that because I don't like reading PowerPoint slides. Now the bad news, you know, I, I did the realistic scenarios and then these are the scenarios that you can just not avoid. These are the things that are going to happen and they will cause, you know, societal collapse on a massive scale. And I'm sorry, these are just going to happen. And, uh, you know, that, we'll just have to deal with it, obviously. You know, a lot, a lot of these go without saying, of course. I'd also like to point out that we have been worried about the apocalypse, the, the tardy apocalypse, I should point out, forever. So the first thing I'd like to point out is a quote from the Epic of Gilgamesh, and I'll actually read this out loud because I find it fascinating. And this is the goddess Ishkar, Ishtar speaking, and she says, I will knock down the gates of the netherworld. I will smash the doorpost and leave the doors flat down, and will let the dead go up in, to eat the living, and the dead will outnumber the living. So the Epic of Gilgamesh is about a 4,000-year-old piece of literature. It had about a 1,000-year oral tradition before that 4,000-year of as a piece of literature. It's the oldest piece of literature we have, and in it, a goddess threatens the zombie apocalypse. So I, I find that fascinating, that not only have we been worried about the apocalypse, but we've also been worried about the zombie apocalypse. I'd also like to point out that Romans thought that Rome would be destroyed in its 20, on its 120th year, which obviously didn't happen. And there's also this verse from Matthew which goes, I tell you the truth, some of some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, or, or the second coming of Christ. Now, modern Christians will say that this is a bad stopping place for the verse, and the next verse explains it. I would like to point out, though, that medieval Christians and Catholics took this literally, and there was a notion of the wandering Jew, because to explain this, they thought there was someone there, when Jesus said this, who was a mortal, it, whether Judas was cursed or what have you, but they had this whole notion of a wandering Jew, which I find fascinating. 
But yeah, long story short, we've been worried about the apocalypse and society collapsing forever. So, me. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is John. I write under J.M. Perkins. So if you ever want to look me up, J.M. Perkins. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about myself and why I'm giving this talk. So first off, I'd like to point out, I have not ever been any of these things. And if you have been, you know things and you've been trained for things, which I have not. And I would love to watch the presentation that you gave on this subject. However, since I can't do that right now, I'll just give it based on what I know, based on my experience, which I'll get right to. So first off, I would like to point out that I grew up here. This is a picture of the orange circle in the city of Orange, in the county of Orange, in the great state of California. It's almost kind of a Norman Rockwellian town, very close to Disneyland, halfway between San Diego and Los Angeles. It's a really nice place to live. Uh, if if you like things closing at 8 in the evening and not too much to do, which is why I left. But very nice place. Uh, very low crime, very nice. I lived in a part of town called Old Town Orange where most of the houses are between 80 and 100 years old. I would like to point out, though, even though it's a very nice slash Norman Rockwellian place, growing up there were three large meth lab busts within two blocks of my home because we had basements, and uh, great for making drugs, apparently. But yeah, I didn't grow up in some compound. I didn't grow up in the woods. I grew up in, you know, very suburban California. This slide I will read out loud because it's kind of my boilerplate, and I, I think it's really important to, to say this out loud. So I would like to point out my parents are kind, educated, warm, and giving. However, for the purposes of this talk, I should point out that they are also post-tribulation biblical literalists. Which means they raised me to believe, and still believe themselves, that the Bible is the literal word of God, written down by humans, proofread by Jehovah, and, more to the point of the talk today, that during the course of my lifetime, uh, we might have, as a family, might have to flee to the wilds of Canada to escape the forces of the Antichrist. Because the U.S. isn't really mentioned in revelatory prophecies, this retreat may or may not have followed a period of total societal collapse in the United States. So growing up, the apocalypse or subtle claps wasn't something that I wrote about, something that I dealt with through fiction and telling stories. It was something that was a realistic possibility within my lifetime Be, and based on biblical, you know, word. It's not how I feel anymore, but my parents still do feel this way. And so this is most of my background, but I would like to point out my parents are awesome. And this in no way is to demean the upbringing they gave me because I'm, I'm really appreciative of the upbringing that my parents gave me. Uh, <laughs> kind of a, it's a visual demonstration. This is a sample birthday present. And what this is, is this is called a water bob. And what a water bob does is it's a plastic bag and pump that you put in your bathtub. And if there's a massive earthquake or if you're just worried, what you can do is you can fill the water bob with water from your bathtub. And it will keep that water fresh and safe to drink much longer than just filling the bathtub with water, which would also be a good idea if you're worried about your water supply being cut off. So yeah, while you were out getting iPads and iPhones, I was getting water bobs, which honestly, it just means my parents love me more because they wanted me to survive the apocalypse. And you know, your parents kind of didn't. <laughs> so sample birthday present for John. I chose the geekiest po picture I could of myself. That's pretty much what I look like. So things I have done slash been. Yeah. I don't recommend any of these things. I'm going to read some of the ones that might be a little hard to read because of the white and black in the background. So a 12 year old me was asked if I was going to be the next Ted Kaczynski. I don't know what I did to make the Radio Shack manager ask me that question. I have spent four days without eating. I don't recommend it. I have performed self surgery. I also don't recommend it. And I only did that because I'm stupid. I have stayed up for three days straight, although amongst gamers, that is not impressive at all. So when I was giving this speech to geeks, I, I'm sure there were people there who could beat me on that. And then the rest you can kind of read for yourself, and I will give you a moment to do that. Oh, and also I'd like to point out, I have had one of my teeth killed in a fight, specifically one of my front teeth. It's, it's false now, it's a crown. Yeah. So my go bag. A go bag is a bag that hypothetically 
holds everything that you would need if you just have to leave town and never come back, and, and potentially even leave society and never come back. Mine is just an ordinary looking backpack. I put food, water, cash, a bunch of things in it. When I presented this to a live audience, the things I did not put in my go bag that I took out were guns, ammunition, a change of clothes, because no one wants to see a change of clothes, cash, silver, and a water bottle. What I did leave in it was some emergency rations, the survival straw, a fire starter, um, and a laser pointer for the presentation, which is normally not in there. But yeah, I would like to point out, go bag, and they're also sometimes called bobs or bug out bags. Again, it's this whole surveillance mindset, you know, if you ever need to flee, you know, the city. However, for me, I also like just taking it when I want to get out of town for a weekend. And if I had one piece of advice about preparing for societal collapse, it's whatever you do, whatever food you acquire, whatever skills you want, make sure you try to integrate them into your life now, because that's the only way to really learn and get comfortable with them, uh, to break them in, so to speak. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is water. Water is very, very important, especially where I live, of San Diego being a semi-arid place. First obvious question is how much water does a person need? And it's a very, very complicated question. Depending on who you ask and what circumstances, you'll get a dozen different answers. On a very base level, if you're sitting around waiting to be rescued, Generally, they recommend drinking half a liter a day, and that's you're really trying to conserve. If you're moving around having a normal life, they recommend two liters every day. And that can be much, much higher if you're really heavily exerting yourself. So realistically, between half a liter and three liters is how much water you need every day. I'd like to point out, having had to carry around water, the water that I needed on a backpacking trip, it weighs a ton and you're much better off having some way to get water as you need it as opposed to carrying all the water you need because it really weighs on you. So you have to do pretty much two things to water that you find in order to be able to drink it and not sicken yourself. You have to filter it and you have to sterilize it. Filtration, you're getting all the real visible particles out of it. And the basic idea for filter, you have say a frame and at the bottom of the frame is a piece of canvas, and over that is sand, and over that is rock. And you pour water, and it flows through the rocks and through the sand and e eventually down through the canvas, and that'll take care of all the big particles like the mud, the th things that you just don't want to be drinking. However, and you collect that in the bottom in a bucket or a bowl. However, once you have that, it still has bacteria and other pathogens in it. So then you have to sterilize it. And the easiest way to sterilize water is to boil it. So you, first you have to filter it, and then you have to sterilize it by boiling it. And then you can drink what's left over. And it won't kill you. This slide I will read out loud because it's kind of my boilerplate. And I, I think it's really important to, to say this out loud. So I would like to point out my parents are kind, educated, warm, and giving. However, for the purposes of this talk, I should point out that they are also post-tribulation biblical literalists. Which means they raised me to believe, and still believe themselves, that the Bible is the literal word of God, written down by humans, proofread by Jehovah, and, more to the point of the talk today, that during the course of my lifetime, uh, we might have, as a family, might have to flee to the wilds of Canada to escape the forces of the Antichrist. Because the U.S. isn't really mentioned in revelatory prophecies, this retreat may or may not have followed a period of total societal collapse in the United States. So growing up, the apocalypse or societal collapse wasn't something that I wrote about, something that I dealt with through fiction and telling stories. It was something that was a realistic possibility within my lifetime be, and based on biblical, you know, word. It's not how I feel anymore, but my parents still do feel this way. And so this is most of my background, but I would like to point out my parents are awesome. And this in no way is to demean the upbringing they gave me because I'm, I'm really appreciative of the upbringing that my parents gave me. <laughs> this slide is about the piss question. Now, if you don't know, the gentleman on screen is named Bear Gillis, and he's famous for doing a show called Man vs. Wild. And he, very smart guy, much smarter than me. 
he is internet famous because he drank his own pee. Now, I was always told, don't drink your pee because it would dehydrate you more. But, you know, he, this is a guy who knows more than I do. So I actually researched the question. I talked to a nurse who knew a little bit about dehydration. And basically the answer I got is, well, you probably shouldn't be drinking your pee. But early on when you haven't been drinking water, you probably, it's still very much a lot of water to salt content. So by drinking it, you'd probably rehydrate yourself a little bit. However, if you are persisting in that practice, you're losing water to exhalation and to sweating. So as time goes on, your pee is more and more salty. So after a couple times, there's more salt to water, the ratio is bad, and by drinking that, you will actually be dehydrating yourself more. So to simplify, basically you're okay for drinking your pee a couple times. After a couple times though, your salt to water content in the pee is only going to dehydrate you more. I would still recommend not drinking your pee. Not something that I ever want to do or I ever plan to do, but I guess it's something you could do. Ah, now I'm going to be talking about food. And I bring up this photo because this is some people preparing rats for dinner. These are not in a people in a post societal collapse kind of way. They just eat rats, and there's nothing wrong with that. The main thing I would talk about food in any type of society has collapsed situation is we're going to have to get over our squeamishness. There's going to be lots of things that we will probably need to eat, which are entirely safe for us to eat, that we'll just have to do because we want to live. Yeah, so squeamishness mostly. First obvious question is how much water does a person need? And it's a very, very complicated question. Depending on who you ask and what circumstances, you'll get a dozen different answers. On a very base level, if you're sitting around waiting to be rescued, generally they recommend drinking half a liter a day, and that's you're really trying to conserve. If you're moving around having a normal life, they recommend two liters every day. And that can be much, much higher if you're really heavily exerting yourself. So realistically, between half a liter and three liters is how much water you need every day. I'd like to point out, having had to carry around water, the water that I needed on a backpacking trip, it weighs a ton. And you're much better off having some way to get water as you need it, as opposed to carrying all the water you need, because it really weighs on you. So you have to do pretty much two things to water that you find in order to be able to drink it and not sicken yourself. You have to filter it and you have to sterilize it. Filtration, you're getting all the real visible particles out of it. And the basic idea for filter, you have, say, a frame. And at the bottom of the frame is a piece of canvas. And over that is sand. And over that is rock. And you pour water and it flows through the rocks and through the sand and eventually down through the canvas. And that'll take care of all the big particles like the mud, the things that you just don't want to be drinking. However, and you collect that in the bottom in a bucket or a bowl. However, once you have that, it still has bacteria and other pathogens in it. So then you have to sterilize it. And the easiest way to sterilize water is to boil it. So you, first you have to filter it and then you have to sterilize it by boiling it. And then you can drink what's left over and it won't kill you. Preservation. 
big deal, something we're really not prepared for because we're used to the convenience of having a fridge and freezer. But these are lots of ways, some example ways of how you prepare, how you preserve food. I would like to point out though, on a very base level, our best and oldest food preservation technology is cooking. Cooked meat lasts a lot longer than uncooked meat. And more importantly, I would say the best way to preserve food is in your body. If you can eat more without getting, without sickening yourself, do it. Because if you can put on a pound or two, and again, this is in a situation where you, food is not readily available. If you can put on a pound or two, that can keep you going. And, and that those calories will be available when you need them. If you can't do it that way, then there's other options. And you can definitely look into this. But cooking is probably the easiest in the way we're most used to. So, shelter. <laughs> um, I picked this image because I wanted to make a, you know, Rolling Stones, gimme shelter reference. But this is what I found, and I thought it was ridiculous. And I'd like to point out that I'm using a ridiculous picture for shelter because at least where I live, it's not so much a big deal. San Diego, you could die of exposure, but you really have to try at it. Moreover, we kind of get shelter. Uh, keep yourself dry and keep yourself warm. And there's lots of things about how to make an uh, emergency shelter, this, that, and the other thing. But there's going to be a lot of structures around. There's going to be freeway overpasses. If you've seen homeless posting up somewhere, that's probably a pretty good place to keep yourself somewhat dry and somewhat warm. And that's assuming you can't actually find a residence to be inside. So shelter, while important, is not the most important thing and something that I think that we get, something I don't think I need to spend too much time on. Hygiene, <laughs> very important. Uh, definitely follow the hygiene tips. I would definitely recommend taking care of yourself hygiene-wise. Most importantly, take care of your feet. Keep them dry. Keep changing your socks. Don't tr Try not to put on wet socks. Keep your feet dry and uninfected. It's probably the most important thing, I, and I can vouch for that based on unfortunate personal experience. So yeah, uh, soap will be your friend in this or any world. So... I would like to point out, first off, is that the apocalypse is always tardy. This picture is from San Diego. This was a billboard ad, and what happened is there was a Christian sect here back last year, in 2011, who was just convinced that they knew the last day, which was May 21st, 2011. They had their members sell all their possessions, cash in all their financial instruments, and yeah, they took that money and they used it to buy billboard and bench ads. And of course, the world didn't end then. I would like to point out I have a sincere belief that informs everything that I think about violence. And I want to explain it because it's very important to understand this about me moving forward. So I personally believe that humans have an inherent bias towards being good. And I'm going to give you my thought experiment to explain this. If I was on the other side of a two-way mirror and I had electrodes hooked up to me, and behind that two way meter was a stranger. And that stranger can push one of two buttons. He can push a button to either shock me or he can push a button to give me a cookie. 99.999% of the time, that, per that stranger is going to push the button to give me a cookie because that's our bias to be good. We will make things better as human beings. We'll make things better all else being equal. Uh, and I, I think that's all you need to really say to buy, say something is good is if we really do want to make things better. We don't want to make things worse. However, that bias towards being good is very slight compared to our bias to be tribal. And we are heavily biased to being tribal. And basically how, what, how this affects things, we will do amazing, selfless, beautiful things for the people that we love, for whoever we consider to be in our tribe. At the same time, we can justify just about any 
despicable, horrible thing to people who are not, quote unquote, in our tribe. Moreover, our tribal bias means that we are heavily influenced by hierarchy. We do what leaders tell us to do, even if we don't think it's right, just because that's how we're wired. So I think that in the event of societal collapse, yes, people will still be good. People will still try to be kind and giving, but their their tribal biases are going to be what causes a lot of the messed up stuff to happen. And, and that's, I think, how we should look at it moving forward. That being said, the most important thing you can do, <laughs> and excuse the picture, the most important thing you can do in the event of societal collapse is you need to gang up. And what I mean by that is you need to find a group of people who have your back and whose back you have. It's not only important on a basic security level, because everyone's got to sleep and everyone's got to be vulnerable. It's just the way it is. But it's important on living through the next day. You need to have people who care about you and, and people that you yourself care about, because that's what's going to keep us going much more than any personal desire to succeed, is, is doing right by the people that we care about. So gang up. Find your clan, find your tribe, find whoever, and try to be nice to everyone else, but, but find some people who will bleed for you. That's the most important thing. After you, you know, making sure you're getting fed and you're not dying of dehydration. I'd also like to bring up some violence and fight statistics, because I think these are very telling, and I think that these can kind of dispel some of the notions we have about how violence works. So, over 90% of police gunfights are le at less than 15 feet. So gunfights in the real world, uh, and again, non-military gunfights, I should point out, are very close. So even with that you know, closeness, hit percentages for police, they, they vary, but realistically, we're looking at about 12% of bullets used by police actually hit. So oftentimes we'll see a action movie where just nobody can hit the hero. And we, we find that incredibly unrealistic. I would like to point out, though, that is kind of realistic, except that everybody, e even the bad guys, would have that same kind of everybody misses about them because most shots fired do not hit their intended target. It's just the way it goes. More amazingly, I think, is that our the best estimate we can produce for U.S. military forces in Iraq, they use 250,000 small caliber rounds for every insurgent, quote unquote, they kill. And I just find that fascinating. That That is just such a weight of metal and ammunition. That if you dropped that much metal on someone, you'd kill them for sure. But again, it's about getting that bullet where you need it to go. And most shots fired don't end up going where they need to go. Although military is different because they're using suppressant fire and yada yada. But still, incredible number. I'd also like to point out, and especially I think this is fascinating in a society like ours which is so afraid it seems all the time crime is down in just about every category and violent crime even more so so we are much safer statistically this year than we were 10 years ago and definitely than we were 20 years ago there's just not as much crime uh, last thing I'd like to point out and there are lots of studies about this and they kind of disagree with each other but the basic consensus is this resisting assault or robbery Resisting crime does not in any way make you more likely to be injured, as near as we can figure. And, and this is where the studies get a bit shaky, but it seems to be the consensus, in many cases, resisting, with or without a weapon, makes it less likely that the victim will be injured. And again, I encourage you to do your own research on this because there's lots of studies, but that's my read on the research. Hygiene. <laughs> Very important. Uh, definitely follow the hygiene tips. I would definitely recommend taking care of yourself hygiene-wise. Most importantly, take care of your feet. Keep them dry. Keep changing your socks. Don't tr Try not to put on wet socks. Keep your feet dry and uninfected. It's probably the most important thing, I, and I can vouch for that based on unfortunate personal experience. So yeah, uh, soap will be your friend in this or any world.
Last couple things about violence. Violence is horrible in, in all honesty, in all realism. Violence is incredibly damaging, not only to the quote unquote victim, but also the perpetrator. There's a good, well, it, you honestly just have to look at um, post-traumatic stress disorder coming from officers involved in shootings or soldiers. And these are people who have been very much trained and prepared for, for a violent life. But even so, it's incredibly psychologically, dam psychologically damaging to, to be involved in violence. So you want to avoid it. In a post-societal world, you might not get that option. But still, you have to try to avoid it because it's so damaging. The one thing I will mention, if you do need people to get violence, uh, masks and or uniforms are very effective psychological tools to get people over that hump of not wanting to engage in violence. So this is a Molotov cocktail, which I will not be teaching you how to make, although they are incredibly, shockingly simple to make. And I would like to point out that two gallons of gasoline has about the same destructive capacity as a stick of dynamite. The reason I say this is because it is not what will determine the outcome of a fight or, or your ability to defend yourself. It is not, in the end, what tools you have or, or, or even to some degree with the training you have, although both those things help. The most important thing is having the will to fight, having the willingness to defend yourself. And there are lots of options and there's lots of ways to get around not having, quote unquote, the right stuff. As long as you have that will and you have made that decision that you're going to protect what's important to you. So if you are thinking about the apocalypse or even, you know, just because, there's some obvious skills that you could very much develop, which would be incredibly useful. And the two go-to ones are obviously maintenance of weapons and use of weapons and advanced medical knowledge. However, there's a lot of less obvious skills that will probably be even more important. Sewing, cooking, brewing, my personal favorite, baking, midwifery, although that's hard to practice, soap making, gardening, mechanical arts, and also, importantly, negotiation and conflict resolution. These are some things that you can incorporate into your life now that would really help out should the world radically change. The great thing too is I personally find uh, deep satisfaction in doing things with my hand in some of these older crafts and skills that I don't get from my work as a writer. It, and you know I, I'm very satisfied to be a writer, but even so, it's really great to know how to you know fix your fix your car or how to make something that is of use to you. So, you have to do pretty much two things to water that you find in order to be able to drink it and not sicken yourself. You have to filter it and you have to sterilize it. Filtration, you're getting all the real visible particles out of it. And the basic idea for filter, you have, say, a frame. And at the bottom of the frame is a piece of canvas. And over that is sand. And over that is rock. And you pour water and it flows through the rocks and through the sand and eventually down through the canvas. And that'll take care of all the big particles like the mud, the th things that you just don't want to be drinking. However, and you collect that in the bottom in a bucket or a bowl. However, once you have that, it still has bacteria and other pathogens in it. So then you have to sterilize it. And the easiest way to sterilize water is to boil it. So you, first you have to filter it and then you have to sterilize it by boiling it. And then you can drink what's left over and it won't kill you.
So the first thing I'd like to talk about is water. Water is very, very important, especially where I live, of San Diego being a semi-arid place. Okay, so last thing, some further resources if you're interested in this. So a couple books, and there's tons, but great books, Emergently, Emergency Preparedness the Right Way by Howard Godfrey. The SAS Survival Guide. If you don't know, SAS is the British Special Forces. And also John Wiseman is an awesome author name, I think. Also uh, Back to Basics which is great too because that's more on the skills level and, and doing things that are cool in this world even without it changing anything. Also, if you have time and you like podcasts, the Long Now Foundation calls does a podcast called SALT, which is seminars about long-term thinking. And they had a speaker named Dmitry Orlov on there and he did a presentation called Societal Collapse Best Practices. Fascinating. And it was fascinating because it was based on his experience in the collapse of the USSR. And it's completely different mindset than what we traditionally get in the United States about, you know, uh, survivalist thinkers. I highly recommend it. Look it up. That's Dmitry Orloff, Societal Collapse Best Practices. Lastly, if you're interested in me, I have two websites, www.strugglingwordguy.com. Once again, www.strugglingwordguy.com. And actually, you'll find this presentation's both the video version and a dry presentation version notes and links to my other projects including my novelette which you should totally buy and is very much informed by my upbringing you know as a survivalist also i have another website called john versus patrick.com and that's more for my funny stuff i'm in an ongoing awesomeness competition but yeah jm perkins those are my two websites and if you want to reach me it's john at strugglingwordguy.com so yeah i hope this was useful for you Feel free to share it and promote it any way you like. And yeah, be well.